All right, very good. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see everybody and uh, be together. For those of you tuning in uh, online, um, greetings to you. Please feel free to uh, give a little shout out underneath the video to, to welcome one another because I know that uh, one of the things I found for people that have been home and have been home this whole time is it, it's uh, it, the, the feeling of isolation. Uh, is, is, is burdensome and uh, so how important it is just for simple little things like good morning and things like that coming underneath that video so uh, feel free to do that uh, if you're tech savvy and you have your phone with you right now get on Facebook right now and say good morning we're saving a seat for you and uh, anything you'd like to do along those lines um, so this morning uh, we finish up our perspective on the pandemic and uh, it really has been an opportunity for us to look at um, what do we do as church about what is going on in this world? Uh, because we are called, uh, and I'm going to use this, in fact, I'm going to overuse it today. We are called to be the salt, right? And you can see on the back side of your Bible study, there's actually a salt shaker back there, which is going to be our focal point for today. Um, we are called to be salt. Everybody's got to look now, right? It's like you don't believe me. <laughs> I bet it isn't there. Okay. All right. So the point is, is that we are called to interact in this world. Let me just put things into context for us. And I'm not really saying this to go down this rabbit trail because it's not our purpose today. But what is going on? The unrest in our world right now, as I prayed this morning, if you heard that uh, in the early service, we are called to be the voice in this world that brings healing. Right? We are to be the voice that brings healing. Peace. Because we know, because of the Holy Spirit, because Pentecost, right, we know where true peace comes from. If you're waiting for our government to bring peace, it will come up short, right? Because they just want peace as a lack of conflict, right? And it's going to have certain boundaries. Now, I'm glad that they want to do that, and I want them to maintain a certain level of safety and security in this country, but you and I, because of the Holy Spirit and because of what Jesus has done, we know what peace is. And if we brought peace, if we communicate that peace to this world, those kind of things are very rarely going to happen. Because people are simply going to go, that doesn't move us in this direction, in a place of unity, in a place of love, in a place of empathy and compassion. Right? That's, that's what's missing and so forth. Now you can see this. And I, again, I don't want to go down this rabbit trail and suddenly I'm a few steps down it. Um, when we realize how we have removed God from our public square and, right, we can't just shake our finger at that, and we have gotten quiet. We start to see the things in our society start to change. We see families change. We see marriages change. Uh, we see the things that we stand up for change. Or maybe they disappear. Right? Guys, it has always been up to us and our responsibility to be the voice in this world. We are meant to be the loudest voice. We're not meant to be the sleeping giant. I hate that phrase. Right? When people go, oh, the Christian church is the sleeping giant. Shame on us then. Right? The only people that are sleeping are the saints waiting for Jesus to return. Right? We are meant to be actively involved and engaged in a world uh, that desperately needs salt. So let's talk about that. How can I partner with God to redeem this crisis? Please don't think I am creating an equality between us and God. But how can I go along with what God is doing? I've quoted this, uh, this book. Actually, there's two books several times uh, from a, a pastor, Greg Finke. I used to work um, with uh, Pastor Finke, and he's, he's written a couple books of joining Jesus on the mission. I've referenced that a few times. Good books, uh, good things for us to recognize how we can be influencers out there. He's actually, he lives in Minneapolis, and uh, just three blocks from his home is where some of the businesses have been hit. And uh, it, it has been amazing. I've just been reaching out, talking with him a little bit of, of what life has been like a little bit. Um, what you recognize is that that's our job as Christians, to partner with God. God is going to do what God intends to do. He makes that very clear in his word. He changes things slightly through his Holy Spirit, depending on the context. I, I love what Paul says, right? I try to become all things to all men so that some might be saved. You can't deliver the same message the same way all the time. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, before, I was a, well, before I was a senior pastor, um, I was an associate pastor back in St. Louis, and my responsibility was high school youth and college students, young adults. I got to tell you, I spoke to them differently than I speak to you. 
Right? I changed my vocabulary a little bit so that it was more relatable or, or more understandable. I wouldn't necessarily throw out my you know, $25,000 doctrinal questions you know, or use that terminology. Sometimes you'd be like, well, it's like this. Right? So you try to customize how you're going to reach those people. We do the same thing. We have got to be able to talk to our neighbors. We've got to be able to talk to our coworkers. We've got to be able to talk to our family members. And sometimes that means we've got to not one size fit all, but just recognize what's going on. That's why it's so important for us to be aware of what's going on in the world, right? I, I watch just enough TV to keep me relevant, all right? That, it, that, that really is, is probably true for me. I, I read just enough to keep me relevant and so forth. I don't want a steady diet of it, right? Some of you know what that's like, right? You know somebody or you yourself struggle with. If you have a steady diet. Of, of certain media, certain media, uh, it influences you. You start to feel a certain way, right? And that goes on both sides of the spectrum, right? There, there, it, it just does. And so I, I want to make sure that um, our regular um, uh, nourishment is, is going to come mostly from God's word and then balance that through the context of my existence in my world around me. So this pandemic has created new ways to reach new people. The fact that this phone is levitating here on a stick uh, in front of me is one of those examples, right, that we're able, now we were doing this before the pandemic, but um, I was actually talking to one of our elders this morning before church, and uh, we were talking about, well, what are we going to do um, when this pandemic kind of comes to an end, right, when we're able to be out and, and be around and so forth, as far as streaming services and putting things up on the website and Facebook, here, here's my, uh, my two cents on it, we're going to keep doing it. Right? And not because our members are necessarily still at home. Some of them will be. I think this is wonderful to reach some of our shut-ins and, and some people that are ill and, and so forth. But we have had people tune in. There's people tuning in right now on this Bible class um, that aren't necessarily members of Faith Lutheran Church here in Jeff City. But they're tuning in because God's Word speaking to them. I thank God for that. So why would we stop that? But then that means that we've got to be able to kind of embrace what does it mean to do this long term then? It means we've got to change some things. Eventually, I want to get back up to the rail for communion, which means we've got to get that TV out of the way, right? But to still stream it to people, we've got to make some changes. So the point is, is this pandemic has opened some things for us in ways to communicate. Some of you have, um, I, I know some of you even frequented out to um, Honey Creek and, and seen Drive Up Church, right? Where people are pulling up their cars and they're up on a, on a flatbed, kind of on a big scaffolding to be able to preach and teach from up there. That's creative, Right? Now, I know for some of you that have been here at Faith for a long time, that kind of sounds like uh, Easter sunrise service at the drive-in. Right? I have loved hearing those stories, by the way. Right? Uh, and so forth. That's what a, a, a situation like a pandemic can do. It opens our eyes to go, hey, there's these unique needs. How do we meet them? And I thank God that we're, we're together as a church that's been willing to do that. Could you imagine if you just go, we're not doing anything different? But we would have just closed up shop for two and a half months. Right? And that would have been, I was, you know, reflecting this with somebody 50 years ago, maybe not even that, 20 years ago. Um, we would have just been making phone calls and sending letters. That would have been our best way to communicate with our people. Now, at the time, that would have been the best way, and people would have gone, okay. Now, look what we get to do. Right? We get to come right to their homes and, and, and communicate. I have, I have people that tell me, they say, yeah, I, I watch you on my phone. Really, I just can't imagine how interesting that must be to just sit there like that. I'd, need, I'd have such a headache after a while. But, but that technology is there. I'm thankful that we can just pop up a phone that is smart enough <laughs> to be able to do this. So we've learned things. And so our way of partnering with God to be able to say, how do we continue to reach beyond these walls? Now, what I don't want is get lazy. I don't want us to sit back and go, boy, isn't it great that the Internet is doing what we should be doing? Right? And good for the internet. Because yeah, I can tell you, as soon as the power goes out, so does a lot of those opportunities. Right? Or as soon as something crashes or, or whatever doesn't work. We're still called to do the same things. I just think there's different opportunities. Right? Uh, in your Bibles, open up to Matthew 5, 13. That's going to be our main focus for today. Matthew 5, 13. Now... Go ahead, keep going. Very good. Thank you, David. If everybody would still open that up, I know that if you didn't see it and have it, have it open because we're really going to focus a lot 
on, on that verse. In fact, when we turn around to different places, um, keep your finger there because that's going to be our main focus, to be salt. Because we are still called to be salt in this world. I've used this before. Um, you know, we sometimes think very uh, monocularly, right? That, that's a, use that today, uh, that word. Um, that we tend to just kind of look at our own context and we don't understand that when God is speaking through his word, he's speaking not only globally, but he's speaking for all time, right? Sometimes we just kind of go, well, this is just for us. We're a, a God-centered, God-fearing country and based on the, the, the mandates and the morals of, of God's word and so forth. So this is all really to us. I don't want you to be upset by this, but do you understand that God's purpose was not to have the United States of America? That wasn't his long-term goal. Right? His long-term goal was heaven. Now, praise the Lord, we live in a country where there's a great deal of freedom, but there's a lot of places where this freedom is not a, available and is not a, 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 a apparent, and yet God still speaks to Christians in those countries. In fact, the job of Christians, no matter where they live, is to be salt. Right? And so if, if we're talking about Christians in Cambodia, where there is tremendous Muslim persecution there upon Christians, their job is to still be salt. Is it different than ours? Absolutely. It's different for them to carry out being church than it is for you and I. None of us are really risking life and limb by coming here today. None of us. Right? And yet there are places where people do risk their very lives, their very livelihoods, their family, their connections, um, their status, whatever the case may be. Tremendous risk, and yet God still calls them to be salt. This isn't just preaching to the Americans. And often we think that way. We kind of go, okay, this is for us. We Americans, we're good, right? And so forth. Now, I'm very thankful. I right? don't take that wrong, okay? But the, don't, don't think that that's the goal. The goal is God to say, I want you to be salt. In fact, there are places outside of this country that need to know about the salt of, of God's word and God's love, um, maybe even more so than here, maybe. I don't know. I think it's kind of how you could look at it. So let's walk through this a little bit. The first one is to ask this question. Who then is spiritual salt? God says be salt. Okay, so who is that? It's not literally to be the, the, the mineral salt. Uh, it's to be spiritual salt. So let's kind of take a look at this. If we look at I'm going to give you a little uh, quick lesson in Greek. We're not going to use the words, but I'll just give you some background. The first one is this. When it says you are the salt of the earth, the you there is plural. It is not you singularly, whoever's reading it. It's like you all, or actually all y'all, right? That's actually, the, that's the Greek, right? Because there, there is a you all form of do, which is you, and then there's the other one that's do with an emphasis, and it's all y'all, okay? So if you were Galilean and Texan, <laughs> you would say all y'all are salt of the earth. Okay? So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have, to use this morning's Pentecost theme, if you have the presence of the Holy Spirit within you, you are one of the all y'alls. Okay? You are salt. Right? That means every follower of Jesus. This is not Christianity 2.0. Right? This isn't what you aspire to. One day I want to graduate to being salt. Right? That means with that little baby that I baptize, right? Not too long ago, right? That little baby becomes salt. Now, they're not really all that effective yet, right? But because they don't speak, that's not the only way to communicate God's grace and God's gifts. They are just by their very presence, their very life. Holy Spirit's already alive and working, okay? And so we recognize that if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are salt. So if you're waiting for an invitation to be salt, there it is. All y'all are salt. Okay? I'm going to see how many times I can say that phrase. Now, you are salt no matter your past. No matter what your past is, you are not disqualified. This is one of the things I think I deal with often as a pastor with these sometimes very intimate conversations that I have. Uh, with people that, that there's a confession happening, they share some of their past, and, and they realize, they, they believe, not that they realize, they believe that there are barriers to God using them, right? They'll say things like, Pastor, you have no idea, and then they finish that sentence in however way that they feel that I'd be surprised, right? And most of the time I answer the very same way, I don't care. I mean, I care, but it's not important, okay? Stan? 
Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. 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 You, you take a look at, at the disciples. You look at Paul. And in fact, Paul suffered a great deal. In fact, God told him that. Right? He says, you're going to be my greatest missionary. You're going to suffer worse than most. Right? And uh, you're thinking, wow, what a, what a job interview. Right? Yeah, I'd like to use you to do some great things. By the way, it's going to be really hard. Uh, in fact, one of the verses today, one of the sections in Scripture in the sermon, 2 Corinthians, Paul outlines that. God often uses uh, surprising things to do His work. Right? When you think about it. Think of uh, the dust that He used to make Adam and Eve. Right? That's kind of an unusual thing. He could have just gone, poof, there's a human form. But he used dust. Right? Correct. Correct. Yes, which is the next one here. All right? A rib. Okay? Um, by the way, I love that image. Uh, I, I use that often when I'm, I'm meeting with uh, premarital counseling with people. Um, God didn't take a part of the head of Adam to make Eve because the head is superior. He also didn't take a bone from the foot of Adam to make Eve because that would be inferior right instead right here because the rib when you think about it out of all of them it's just one of many right but it's right here side by side partnership okay right and, and I just think that's a beautiful image uh, as we see that God says I'm going to use that to make Eve not something that is superior or inferior but a partner okay now don't read into that any more than the world would like to read into that and God still creates differences between us but um, that's how he created them. Slingshot. Use a slingshot for David to be successful. Um, used a baby born in Bethlehem in the form that the Savior would come into this world. God often uses unusual and surprising things to do his work. So no matter your past, but also no matter your future, right? Where you are headed, where you are going, um, as you think about your development and so forth in your faith walk, Keeping your finger there in Matthew uh, 5, turn to 1 Corinthians 1. We talked about Paul. Take a look at that, please. Somebody read it, 27, 28, and 29. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Isn't that incredible how, you know, God points it out through Paul that he says God intentionally uses things that will surprise you, right? He'll take the things that are weak and say from that something rises up. Do you remember when David was chosen as king? Why was that a shocker? He was the little guy. In fact, he didn't even show up for the tryout, right? As, as the prophet, the priest comes through and he's like, nope, nope, don't be like duck, duck. Duck, duck. Hey, Dad, is this all of them? Well, there's the runt, but he's out, he's out taking care of the sheep. He's really just a herder, right, and a shepherd. I, I don't say, really? You want to, no, he said all of them. God said bring them all, okay? Um, so when you think about what God has used, I mean, how much more advan how much more examples, many more examples do you need from Scripture that God can use you, intends to use you? I remember once when I, I think I've shared this story, when I was in high school, I went to a public high school and, and we had a guy come in. This is way back when, when you could still talk about God in the public high school a little bit. This guy came in, he had this incredible testimony about what his life had been. He had been on drugs, he had been in jail and got to know uh, Jesus through the chaplain that was there and just total turnaround and, and, and this had great inspiring story to all the students in the, in the high school. And I remember coming out of there talking to my friend and, uh, and he said, so what'd you think of that guy? And I said, man, I wish I was on drugs. <laughs> now what I meant by that, I wasn't being flippant, that, that probably often the case. What I was saying is, I wish I had a story like him. I was like, I wish that I had this tremendous death to life, darkness to light transformation that people would go, wow, right? And, but that's pretty selfish and self-serving. Instead, you come to realize God wants to use you, who you are, where you are, and how he made you. And, and what we end up doing is sometimes we look. I, I tried to always be sensitive to that when I was, uh, when I was a, a pastor over um, high schoolers. 
often at the end of a youth group, we would get together in what we called our, our little groups, and uh, we'd pray for one another. And, and guys got any prayers and things we'd ask. And I would often, one, every one of our adult leaders would have a group. And uh, one of the things that, that I would be really sensitive to and I would tell my other adults to do is I said, be careful how you pray. Because as adults, we tend to get comfortable with prayer. Teenagers, not so much, especially out loud. And so if I sat there and kind of go, I'll start. Heavenly Father, creator of all that is good, the Yahweh, the, uh, you know, all these things. And they're just kind of going, I can't pray like that. Right? Because that's, that's over the top. If that's what means to talk to God, I can't do it. Right? And so you've you got to step back and just be able to go, hey, God, this hurts. Right? And they're like, what, you, can, you can talk to God like that? And I said, as long as you trust that he's God. Right? And, and yes, you can. And so that was, that was important for us to see uh, of what that is and recognizing uh, that as God calls us. The R in that, in your little bullet point there, underneath that, uh, no matter your future, the R is present tense. You are, all y'all are the salt of the earth. R means present tense. Doesn't mean becoming, doesn't mean it's future. It simply means that you are salt, right, at this very moment. So, that also goes into this. Then salt is salt no matter where it is. I thought about this um, Yesterday, when I was down here kind of setting things up and getting things squared away, I thought about getting out salt shakers and putting it on all your tables. <laughs> you know, sitting at a table and having these salt shakers sitting out in front of you because we got a whole bunch of them, right? And put them out there. So just imagine that there's one there, okay? Now, that salt in the salt shaker, inside the shaker, is still salt, right? Right? If you pour it out on the table, is it still salt? Yeah. If you put it on food, is it still salt? If you drop it in your mouth, ugh, Right? I mean, straight salt, and not the salt bad, right? It's still salt, right? So no matter where salt is, it's salt. So I want you to think of yourself, if all y'all are, present tense, salt. Anybody keep track how many times I'm saying that phrase? <laughs> Megan is? Good. All right. Okay? I'm trying to break my record. Okay? The point is, is that you are salt. You don't cease to be salt if you're not being sprinkled. Right? You don't cease to be salt if you're not with other salt. You're, not, you know, you're always salt. Now, the, the verse in, in Matthew 5 tells you very clearly what's good about salt when it's useful. Because there is time where if I put salt in a salt shaker and I kept it in that salt, salt shaker indefinitely, it's not doing any good, is it? Right? If salt is meant to flavor food and preserve food, we don't use that much because we have refrigeration, but back then they would have. If it's not being useful... Right? It's not all that helpful inside of a salt shaker. Okay, so the, the job is get that salt out of the salt shaker, even though while it's in there, it's still salt. You all right here in this room are all salt. All y'all are. Right? How many am I up to? A nine? <laughs> all right, let's keep going. So what does, um, oh no, sorry, let's go back. Uh, sorry, I jumped that. Uh, gentlemen, if you have uh, 1 Corinthians 12, would you read that? And uh, ladies, first. Uh, Acts 1.8, that should be a very familiar verse before we move on from that. Salt is salt no matter where it is. I love that image. Now we're mixing our, our images a little bit from salt to body. But you understand that you are, I'm going to say it, all y'all are members of the body. Uh, and it, it actually is the same same phrase there in, in the Greek that Paul uses. Every one of you is a, is a part of the body. And if you cease to function that way or you just deny being a part of the body, it's like this. Um, last night, uh, this is more than you want to know about your pastor, but I'm going to share it anyhow. I'm laying on my belly in my bed. I put my arm up like this, okay? And when I put my arm up like this and I'm laying on my pillow, on my belly, right, it pinches something right up here, right? Blood flow and a nerve, okay? Now, what happens to your arm then? Falls asleep. Okay? Now, when that falls asleep, this arm for a time is useless. Okay? Here's what used to freak me out. I'd wake up at night and kind of just groggy and so forth, and I'd see this hand on my pillow. <laughs> Naturally do this, right? And if I can't feel it, then I'm pretty sure it's somebody else's arm. <laughs> and Kristen's on this side. <laughs> I just imagine somebody on the side of my bed reaching up like this. Yeah. I did that once. I actually grabbed the hand, tried to throw it off, smack myself in the face. Woke my wife up laughing, right? Just giggling. She goes, what is wrong with you? Oh, the list is long. Right? 
But the point is, when your arm falls asleep for a time, this part of the body is useless. If you decide, I don't want to be part of the church. I don't want to be part of the body of God. Do you realize that you are a part of the body, just like salt? You don't get to volunteer or, or say, today I'm going to be a hand, but tomorrow I'm not going to be the hand. God says, I made you to be the hand. Be the hand. Don't complain about being the hand. Like, I want to be the ear. Gets to hold sunglasses on and things like that. That's so cool. Right? God says, I made you a hand. Be a hand. And guess what? The elbow needs you to be the hand. Otherwise, the elbow is just kind of moving something else. Okay? Right? Be what God has called you to be. Ladies, Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses, right? Now, can there be a bad witness? Yes, there can be. Now, if you let the Holy Spirit have access to you, you will be a good witness. But if you decide, see, it's like this. I remember once I was uh, checking out uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, a supermarket. This is back when I was, uh, I think it was when I was a teacher. so a long, long time ago. Um, doesn't really matter. I was, I was checking out in the grocery store, and I had a WWJD bracelet on, right? If you remember what that was, right, what would Jesus do? It was, it was kind of the equivalent of putting a fish on your car, right? You'd wear this, right, and so forth. I'm checking out this lady in front of me, and I was in a rush. I don't know what kind of mood I was in. She turned around, she saw it, and saw the, the bracelet, and she goes, Oh, are you a Christian? And I remember just that urgency right then. I don't want to talk about it. I wasn't embarrassed of it. I'm just kind of like going, I, I didn't expect this to be that tool to be able to start a conversation with someone who obviously understood what it was. It wasn't really a great risk, but it, instead, that there's those times like, listen, you are always going to be a witness. Uh, once when I was, uh, I was driving, uh, when I was a teacher uh, at Lutheran West, um, I rode my motorcycle a lot of times back and forth. I was that teacher, right? I, I'm sorry, parents, um, for those parents that are still tuned in this morning that I knew back then. Um, I remember one time I, uh, I was driving down Center Ridge, great big five-lane road not far from our high school, and uh, I'm driving along one of the lanes, and a car just pulls out from one lane, about cuts me off, okay? And a little bit of a short temper, okay? And, and, and some of those thoughts start in the back of my head, start working their way forward, right? And, and so I start whipping around to pull up next to this person to suggest to them maybe their driving isn't the best, and I flip open my face mask and I look into the mirror or into the window that's open now and it's one of my students' moms. <laughs> hey, how are you? <laughs> my witness there was just about awful, right? But it still would have been a witness, wouldn't it? Right? If I would have let something fly that was ungodly and unchristian and so forth, that still would have been a witness. They would have gone, huh, Lutheran high school teacher claims to love Jesus. What a mouth. Right? That would have been a witness. Okay? So we are going to be witnesses. Let's keep going. So what does spiritual salt do? We talked about who it is, right? That it's us. It's all y'all. Right? Okay? And so now what does spiritual salt do? Okay? First of all, it's worth more than gold in the ancient world. Okay? It actually was worth more than gold in that sense. The word salary actually comes from salinity. So when you gained a salary, Right? It actually had to do with, well, what would we gauge it on as far as your weight in salt? Okay? So it was, it was something worth a great deal. Now, you understand that, that salt in the ancient times would have been used to preserve foods. They didn't have refrigeration. So by salting things, it cuts down on bacteria and fungus and things like that. Okay? So it was a way, first of all, salt was the only means of preserving food. Okay? It was the only means that they would be able to do that. Okay? So let's talk about why that's important. Um, Genesis 1.31. Somebody please. Okay, so everything began good. In fact, in, in God's eyes, good means perfect. Okay? So the idea that God says, I'd like to preserve that. Okay, but man and, and, and woman, they, they give in to temptation, they fall into sin. And then Romans 3, 23. Everybody is to blame. The world is broken, we have all sinned and fall short. However, Romans 6, 23. Okay, 
So the consequence of sin is eternal separation from God, but the good news, in fact, it is great news, is that those that put their trust in Jesus Christ will be saved from that eternal separation from God. And so God is calling us, all of us, to be salt so that we can help preserve what it is that God began, perfection, uh, a relationship with God. We can preserve that by sharing Jesus with them, by communicating that. So I want you to think for a second. Don't, don't write it down or anything else, but who are you salt to right now? I want you to think of that. Who are you salt? That you help to preserve what it is that God has given to you in faith. Who are you preserving that? It might be your children as you're continuing to grow them and shape them and nurture them. It might be friends or family. It might be neighbors or co-workers. Who are you that are kind of breathing that good news of Jesus into? You are helping to preserve what God initially had created and is going to bring back around. Right? Because that perfection in Genesis 1, by the way, is coming back. When God says, I'm going to recreate. Recreate means what I did before. Not going to create brand new. Paradise is going to look very familiar, folks. Right? It's going to look extremely familiar. It's not going to be this like, what in the world is this place? You're going to look at it and kind of go, oh, this is what it was supposed to be like. Right? There's going to be a lot of familiarity to it. Salt is always also the primary purification agent. Right? Purification agent. In fact, I'll say it this way. It was the penicillin of the ancient world. Right? A lot of times, now we don't like doing this. I, was, uh, I preached on this last week with uh, Bactine. Right? Remember when you get that skin knee or skin elbow and you had to get Bactine? Now, some of you that are a little older, it was um, meth meth uh, Methylene. Thank you. Right? <laughs> um, and that was another one. I was like, what color did that turn? Is it yellow? Was it red? <laughs> Iodine you'd put on it too. That made it orangish too, didn't it? Anyhow. It all hurt. It all hurt. <laughs> That's exactly right. When they'd put salt in a wound, the same thing, try to cut down on infection, right? To kill bacteria and fungus and things that would cause problems. So it was a purification agent. Very painful and uncomfortable, but purification says, here's what is right. Here's what fixes this. You and I sometimes speak words that feel like that, right? When I have to tell somebody that this is wrong, that this is, this is a sin, this is harmful, and they're like, I don't want to hear that. That hurts. That stings. Right? And yet it's still the purification agent. James 127, someone please. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep one from being polluted by the world. And, and some of the other things of taking care of those in need. Right? But keeping yourself from being polluted by the world. I, I think, um, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, we as Christians, we allow a lot of pollution into our lives. We do. Uh, when we think about the things that we watch and read and time, you know, spend our time doing, there are things that we're like, those aren't good things. Those aren't things that point to Jesus. Those aren't things that build up our faith. Um, those are things that, that erode um, the things that we think are important. I get so frustrated. I spend a great deal of time online, reading, researching, communicating, things like that. And, and I get so frustrated on the things that also pop up online when I'm online. It's so discouraging. And it seems like I'm forever trying to find ways to block and, and bleed out those things and filter those things. And yet the world constantly is chipping away at our faith. And, and so it is important uh, for us. In fact, it's imperative uh, for us to let the Holy Spirit continue to go, not that, not this, but this, right? Purifying, right? That our hearts are purified, that our minds and our senses are purified. Salto is the chief seasoning for the common people, right? If you were wealthy, maybe you had some other things that you could uh, buy and have shipped to you to, to use as seasoning, but the regular Joe would have access to salt, right? And when it came to season things, to add a little seasoning to enrich something, right? Maybe you've had this same thing if, of uh, you're trying to eat right at, at home and so forth, and then you find these ways of like, how can I stomach this? How can I eat this? And you try to find ways to season. Now, the, the goal is not to, I'm going to try to cut down on salt, so I'm going to add salt, right? But the point is it becomes that sense of if something is bland, if something is tasteless, we're like, how can I, how can I enrich that? In a way, guys, I, I think that's somewhat what I do when I preach. 
right? You're trying to take the Word of God and, and put it in a context that is real and applicable and relatable to where we are. You guys know I use stories all the time, right? I mean, just one after the other, even in Bible class. Uh, and, it, and it's meant to be seasoning, right? It's meant to go, it's like my family, or it's like this, okay? Always trying to say, oh, now I understand. Before they were just words and a story, but now uh, there's a context to it, right? And so when we share the gospel, that's why I, I think one of the most powerful things you can do as church, as salt, is share your testimony. What does God mean to you? No one can argue with your testimony. Now, they can argue with facts like, I think God created the world. They could argue with that. They could say, no, I think it happened by chance, big explosion a long time ago. Okay. I love God. No, you don't. See, they can't argue with that. If you say, I love God, he means everything to me, now they're kind of, kind of gauge who you are to them and go, well, what do I think about that? What do I think about this guy, this woman that I know, and, and that they love God? See, nobody can argue with your story. Right? They might argue with data and facts and things like that. You can't argue with your testimony, your seasoning. Okay? John 10.10, 10, someone please. The word abundantly there uh, also means to the full. Right? Um, you've all had this um, experience. I've had it. Uh, my wife is a great cook. Uh, there are times where you have a meal. Uh, it's always dangerous to say this. There's times where we have a meal that is just excellent. Right? Now, there are, now you're naturally asking, well, isn't everyone that she makes excellent? Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? The point is there are times where you just kind of go, oh, this tastes Wonderful. Maybe you go to a restaurant, it's one of your favorite places, and this particular dish, and you go, this is so good. There's something about the taste that you're like, this is fantastic. It's the same word that Jesus is using there. I've come to give them life, and I've come to give it to the full. Now, it's not just speaking about eternity one day. That's where we often go and go, oh, he's talking about heaven. No, he's talking about right here, right now. There is a way... For us to delve deeper into the incredible gifts and love uh, and blessings of God right here, right now. Right? I, I don't know what it was like for you, but yesterday um, was one of the first sunny days we'd had in a while. Right? I came home and went and sat back on our back deck with my wife and my kids. Right? We sat back there, kind of that cool breeze blowing, and I'm just like, what an incredible day. Now, if you happen to like rainy, drizzly days, yesterday was not a great day for you. Right? But for me, and I was just kind of really missing that day, I'm just sitting there just kind of, this is awful. We were starting to get into the full. I've come to give them life and have it to the full. I have seasoned it in a way that it is incredible. My first, uh, my first year of teaching out in Colorado, um, I used to go up into the mountains. Duh. <laughs> right? What else would you do? And, and I'd go out there, and, and I'm telling you what, they, well, the fifth grade teacher out there, a guy by the name of Bruce Janetsky, he was like the Marlboro man. Right, big, tall, lanky guy, cowboy hat, belt buckle, smoke cigarettes, um, and uh, he used to tell me. He says, "Listen, if God doesn't live in Colorado, this is where he spends all his free time." Right, <laughs> just just pointing out that it's beautiful and it's magnificent, and there is something about looking at mountains to just kind of go, "Wow, God, I mean, you're kind of showing off," <laughs> right? Or when you look up in the sky and see the stars, and you see millions of stars. You don't just see one or two and go, "That's pretty cool." God goes, I'm just showing off, right? All the different flowers and things like that. That's the beauty. That is life to the full. We are called to be seasoning in this world. When people are afraid because of a pandemic, how can you season that? What can you speak into that that brings hope, that brings promise, that brings trust, right? We've talked about that. See, if you're afraid of getting the virus and dying, that doesn't season anything. That just leaves milk out to spoil. Instead, to be able to say, here's what I trust. Here's what I know. And then that seasoning grants something to somebody else. Go, I can actually live life a little differently. I don't have to be afraid. Right? I can be vigilant. I don't have to be afraid. All right. So how can we be spiritual salt today? Here's how. The first way is to stay pure. First way is to stay pure. Somebody, uh, Colossians 3, 5. 
and then seven, eight, nine. Just skip six. Do you understand what kind of witness you're going to be if you do those things? Right? You're, going to, you're going to be a really poor witness if you say, Oh, I love Jesus, but I'm angry at most people. I speak evil about people. I lie to people. I gossip about things. right? And I love Jesus. And they kind of go, Boy, that seems really inconsistent. right? And so that idea of staying pure is that is us as Christians. Guys, I, I'd love to tell you that here's the easy part of being a believer. This is the hard part. Because it seems like a lot of things around us today, um, you know, when I think of all the, the violence and unrest in some of the major cities uh, because of what took place last week, it's really easy to get sucked up into that and start having opinions and voicing those opinions and things like that and getting caught up uh, in those kind of things instead to be able to say, what does God call us to be as Christians? And, and don't make that decision apart from the Word of God. Please don't do that. Look at the Word of God and say, what does He call me to be? Now, if you need to go and look at what Don just read, that would be an excellent place to start. Don't do this, 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 or this. Right? Now, if you can start knocking those things out and going, those aren't the things that are going to come out of my mouth or out of my mind or be actions that I portray, then you're in a much better place of shining the light of Jesus, the good light of Jesus, uh, into this world. The second thing we do is leave the salt shaker. I told you, you're salt inside the salt shaker, no doubt about it. But you're not really all that useful in there. If you're being stored in there for a rainy day, it's, it's not all that useful because we need you right now. When we gather together on Sundays, what is this? This is halftime. Which means when halftime is over, we're supposed to go back out. right? And not just wait till the next halftime. Please don't do that. Halftime is not why we practice. Halftime is not why we work out and condition and learn and train and so forth. We do all of that for the game. Halftime is a necessity because we're human. We're frail. We're finite. We need to catch a break and we need to refuel and we need to uh, be shaped and taught and reminded. But we're still called to be church. Church does not just gather under some rooftop somewhere. We do take halftime and we take a Sabbath. But we're called to be church in this world. Matthew 28, 19. Somebody have it? You should know it. So when we go out and make disciples of all nations, there's nobody that's left out of that. Right? Anyone who is not salt, we go and ask to be salt. We go and entice to be salt. We go and lead them to be salt. We go and instruct them on what salt is. We demonstrate being salt. We season them uh, and around them. Third one. This is important. We also need to disappear. Most of the time when you use salt, it, it disappears, doesn't it? You put it into something and you add it to soup or you add it to a food, a lot of times it disappears. When I sprinkle it on the sidewalk when it's icy, right, it disappears. Okay? When I ingest it into my, uh, into my body when I eat something, it disappears. Okay? We don't want to take credit or be the focus of what we do as salt. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm saying. Look how I'm demonstrating this and so forth. We want to get out of the way so that what we salt is somebody for Jesus. And so that they come to know in a relationship with God that will save them. Um, somebody just uh, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6. Keep going. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Perfect. Thank you, Carol. So the idea is that you recognize if you think that, if you believe, not if you think, it's not up to you, if you believe the truth that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, that just makes you act differently. Right? You're just kind of like going, God, use me. I roll out of bed on, on the, in the morning. Most of the time that's my prayer when I hit the floor. Is God, use me today. That's my prayer. And I, I don't necessarily, I've kind of stopped trying to give God direction after that. God, use me today like this. 
right? There's times where I'll kind of say, God, use me today. Give me a great message today, right? Give me an opportunity to do this and so forth because my wife will often ask me, um, you know, after when I come home at, at night, I'm kind of like, well, how'd the day go today? And uh, often the second question is, whose to-do list did you do? Was it God's to-do list or yours? Because I'm big into to-do lists, sticky notes and bullet points and things like that. And sometimes those don't even get touched because God has another plan. And, uh, and I want to be the kind of person that pays attention to say, if God says, go over here, keep going. Not just kind of go, I would, but I got all these things that I've decided are much more important. Last one, be encouraged, right? Believe that God will use you. If he truly has made you to be salt, all y'all right now, here and now, being salt, if you believe that, then be encouraged to be salt. When we come together for halftime, that's what we want to do. When people are afraid because of this pandemic, that's when you are salt. When people are struggling with fears and uneasiness and doubts, that's when you season that conversation with salt, with the very presence and promise of God. That's when we have the opportunity to make an impact, to cast seed, to draw them to God, all of those things in order to make their life um, more reflective of the God that has made them. So church, in this pandemic, as we have kind of walked through this now for several weeks, we've kind of been struggling with the quarantine for three months now, um, and opportunities, people keep coming and, and check in and, and, and touching in and so forth. It is an opportunity for us as salt to be salt. And so uh, don't miss the opportunities. Don't miss those, those chances to be able to speak truth, to be able to speak love, um, to be able to speak words of encouragement to one another. Um, because in that, in that, people are going to be drawn to Jesus, and that's the plan. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, that you have granted us your Spirit on this Pentecost that we celebrate today. Lord, may you continue to season and flavor, preserve uh, this world uh, through the work through us. Right? The Holy Spirit, just we just want to be channels and vessels for, for his work in this world. Lord, may we be... Uh, available. May we be useful. Uh, may we free ourselves of our own bias and our own egos, Lord, just to be instruments and, and parts of the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Next week, we start a brand new study. Thank you for all the recommendations. Uh, the Old Testament book, we're going to study Jonah. Jonah, right?